ladies and gentlemen, very officially. The Oxford Union has a long tradition, as the least you can say. Respect for tradition is a value. And in times where having roots is becoming problematic, it is all the more important. But we must not confuse tradition with living in a museum. Tradition is not about doing the same as our ancestors, but keeping the best of the legacy, keeping their values. And that's what you're doing. In the life of people and of societies, values and interests, and I will come back to those two concepts regularly in my short speech. Values and interests both play a role. You cannot keep a club, an institution, an organization together only on a transactional basis, such as what's in it for me, what is the added value, you have also the notion of value, but it is more in terms of interest, what is the added value, you need more. And the French call it, and I can't translate it, un supplément d'âme, a supplement of the soul, but that doesn't mean nothing, eh? un supplément d'âme. In the world today, values are more important than is often said. In Ukraine, it is about European values. It's about political democracy, a social market economy, they don't have that, and the rule of law. Think at corruption. When Ukraine signed an association agreement with the EU, an, an, asso an association agreement comprises a free trade agreement and an agreement on political cooperation, when they signed it with the EU, Russia was not amused and imposed a cost on the Ukrainian people. It was the beginning of a war in which to date at least 6,000 people have been killed. And the same can happen in Georgia and Moldova. European countries, they turned the page of history decades ago. But Russia is still suffering from nostalgia for the past, for the Soviet Union. Nationalism, is of was what the EU left behind. We are just the opposite of nationalism. And the former French president François Mitterrand once said, nationalism means war. And that's what happened in Ukraine. In Syria, in Iraq, in Nigeria, it's about values, again. It is not a clash of civilizations, but a clash between civilization and barbarism. The enemy of the so-called Islamic State is not only the West, but even more the Islamic regimes in the region. And that's why IS has become a common enemy. Nazism was such a common enemy. They are and were the incarnation of evil. The millions of French people and others demonstrating in January showed that they were, and now I'm quoting the famous American song, that they were not afraid and that we will overcome. It's about basic values. The European idea is based, as I said, on values. In the first place, peace. Through reconciliation and cooperation, the economy was first and foremost an instrument, not an objective. Of course, the economy matters. The wars in our eastern and southern neighborhood shows how precious peace is. By the way, the treaty between France and Germany, the example of reconciliation, the treaty between France and Germany of 1962 was called the Treaty of Friendship. Imagine the word friendship in relations among states. Very unusual word. 
The European community was not created out of fear of the Soviet Union. NATO was. But in order to have peace among European countries themselves, we needed much more. We needed not only goodwill, but institutions. And we still do. The Founding Fathers and their successors wanted to create an irreversible process, even, as they call it, a common destiny. Europe was a choice, but it has also become a necessity. A common market is only a part of this common destiny. 19 countries with 350 million people have chosen a common currency, making interdependence even stronger than when they share a single market. The euro, the euro area, was a political project, even too much a political project. But outsiders seriously underestimated the special characteristic predicting, they predicting, its early death. They underestimated the political will of the leaders to maintain the euro. They were only looking at the theory of the optimum currency area. But it is not enough to understand the launching and the survival of the euro. If the euro fails, the union fails, said the German chancellor. And I would add, so too would the biggest peace project in human he European history. I agree that the euro started with significant flaws in its architecture. And we have already repaired some of them. But we do not yet have what we call a genuine economic and monetary union. We need much more economic convergence, much more economic coordination and solidarity. And the leaders today have to show their determination to go ahead with this deepened economic and monetary union, even without the context of the crisis. Complacency is a widespread temptation in the private and in the public sector. And we have to restore the sense of urgency. The problem with the current Greek government must not be an alibi to neglect the further work on the economic and monetary union. There will always be different economic evolutions inside the monetary union. Look at the inequalities and the divergencies in the United States. The efforts made by most of our member states are aimed at restoring competitiveness, sound public finances and job creation. A lot of the reforms are changing fundamental structures in their economies and their labour market. This is a work of the long haul. And it's all the more needed in a global economy. And by the way, the so-called BRICS countries are also in a phase of reorientation and changing unsustainable models. The existential threat to the euro area is over. But the work is, of course, not yet done. Some are saying now that the common currency divides the euro area. This is a contradiction in terms, a contradictio in terminis. Even the Greek people want, with an overwhelming majority, to stay in the euro area. And three countries, the three Baltic states, have joined the euro area since the outbreak of the crisis in the eurozone. Even if anti-euro parties are in the lead in opinion polls in some countries, and I'm now speaking about the euro, this does not mean that the voters are as anti-euro as their leaders. Not at all. The malaise is often inspired by national motives. And even if the euro divides us today, it will be an intermediate phase in this long-term process. And short-termism is never a sign of wisdom. We have to keep in mind always the broader picture and the larger 
time horizon. Today, the euro area is much more solid than it was two or three years ago. The spread, so-called spread, between the German interest rates on the one hand and those in Ireland, Spain and Portugal, on the other hand, is 0.5 to 0.15 percent. Compare those results with those of a few years ago. But we badly need growth and jobs to convince the people of the euro area that we are on the right track. After difficult years in 2012 and 2013, growth is picking up. A 2% growth on average in 2016, and that's predicted, forecasted, means more than 2% growth before the banking crisis, because the latter was based on imbalances and an accumulation of private and public debt. Even Greece is recovering. That was a forecast a few weeks ago, with a forecast of more than 3% growth next year. And the enormous efforts made by the Greek people in the recent past cannot be wasted or thrown away. It's important that Greece remains a member of the euro area, that the UK remains a member of the Union, and that Ukraine remains close to our Union. Of course, these are different problems. But togetherness is a value. And I think that countries are ready to show more solidarity if Greece takes up more responsibility. I'm convinced also that the 27 EU member states are ready to negotiate with the United Kingdom in accordance with the treaties if this is requested by the UK and which depends on the result of the elections. Britain was part of most of our wars on the continent and therefore must remain part of our peace project. Britain is a major trade partner and investor in both directions. It's a global player, albeit, of course, not to the same extent as in the past. It's a global player always ready to defend our joint European values and our role. But belonging to the EU is also in the interest of your country. The cost of being outside the EU is high, the cost of non-Europe. There are enough figures to demonstrate this. There is no need to go in, into depth on this issue now. A stand alone in a globalized world is almost a contradiction in terms. How can we fight climate change and international terrorism alone? Imagine a free trade negotiation between the UK and the EU, as we are doing with Japan and with the United States, all this after the decades of a common journey in the Union. The idea itself of that kind of negotiation seems very strange, and this is an under understatement. And by the way, Putin will not be impressed by the sanctions of one or a few countries. Leaving the Union is going against a trend in a world that is becoming more interdependent and more integrated. Yes, there is progress in making the world more united. Look at the UN, the climate conferences, the G20. Of course, there are ups and downs, and there are failures. But overall, compared with the past, progress is real and we may not unravel that process. With the aim of so-called regaining sovereignty, one can end up with more dependency, less influence, and therefore less sovereignty. We must not lose Ukraine. Nationalism must not be rewarded. If the sovereignty of Ukraine is not respected, Georgian and Moldova will be the next victims. The Union will survive, but Europe is more than the current European Union. And that's why a united stance vis-à-vis -vis Russia is crucial. Values are at stake, not only interests. Defending economic interests alone leads nowhere. 
Of course, Ukraine has to help itself by reforming the country to make it a modern, value-based state. A new Ukraine will not remain a unitary state after the tragedy of the war. And Ukraine will develop further its association with the European Union and have to find a new and solid neighborly relation with Russia. Until there is agreement on this new Ukraine, internally and externally, the destabilization will go on. Frozen conflict is also unstable. And the EU, of course, has to support Ukraine financially and economically. In the short run, to ensure it survives, and in the long run, to develop a modern economy. Let us not forget that Poland and Ukraine had the same GDP in 1990. But in the meantime, Poland has become four times more prosperous. A closer bond with the European Union is in the interest of the Ukrainian people, who have suffered so much in their history. During my term as President of the European Council, I had the objective of keeping the club together at all times. I had that in mind at all times. Therefore, we went very far in helping Greece. And I'm still proud also that we could agree with 28 members on the European budget. We have to agree with 28. On a 40% greenhouse gas reduction compared to 1990, and we'll achieve this in 2030, that we could agree on the banking union, on the sanctions on Russia, in a cooperative spirit. We could agree in a cooperative spirit together with the United Kingdom. And we signed the association agreements with our three eastern neighbors in the European Council itself. It was a decision taken by the leaders at the highest level. And we were fully aware of the consequences and we were not sleepwalking into a crisis. Croatia became the 28th member state and we started negotiations with countries of former Yugoslavia, among them Serbia, which normalized its relations with Kosovo at our request. Otherwise, they couldn't start negotiations. Stability and peace in the Western Balkans cannot be secured without a European outlook. And don't forget that they had a civil war 20 years ago. The Union is not a fortress. We are negotiating trade agreements with Japan, with the United States, with Brazil in the Mercosur. We concluded agreements with South Korea, Singapore and Canada. And we did the same with East and West Africa. We must protect our people and economies against unfair competition and social and commercial dumping. And we are doing so. And if need be, we will do more. But we must not fall into the trap of protectionism and isolation. We must not be afraid. The future of the world is openness. Not naive, but not anxious either. Dear students, individualism is born out of fear. The others, all others almost, are then considered a threat. This individualism is the consequence of urbanization, globalization and loss of social capital. It is a phenomenon of our time and of our civilization. And we have to reflect on how to rebalance this development with more togetherness. But countering introspection is also a matter of leadership. Political, but also in the rest of our societies. I was elected so many times in my country and I know what political courage means and the difficulties related to it. There is a famous quote in French politics, I'm their leader, so I'm following them. But leadership is also about convincing people. The leader is not just a megaphone. Democracy is interaction between candidates and voters. It is not a one-way street. 
Courage is not always rewarded, but not always rejected either. We must not be mediocre. People tend to prefer the original instead of the copy. An opinion poll is not an election. A non-engaging opinion is different from an act of responsibility, which the voting act is. And at the end, of course, the voter takes a decision. Dear students, the Oxford Union has a long tradition of discussion, debate, of interaction. This was my contribution this afternoon to this great tradition. Thank you. Thanks very much. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Ram Rompoy? Yes, the chap in the front in the blue. If you just wait for the microphone. You spoke a lot about democracy in your speech, so I've got one question. Who elected you? Who elected, you? Who elected me? The people. The people that elected me many, many times in my own country, as I said. For the European Council, it was something different. There, the Treaty of Lisbon is clear. You are elected by the leaders, who themselves are, of course, elected. So it is an indirect election. But I was elected all my life. I'm even happy. That's one of the, let's say, the positive things of being retired, that I had not to participate anymore in election campaigns. <laughs> In my family, last elections, my wife was elected, my brother was elected, uh, my son was elected. I was the only one who, for, for the first time, was not a candidate in elections. So don't tell me anything about elections. I know everything about elections. Thank you. So in your speech, you've talked about this theory that the, the different economies in the euro area have different velocities. So there might be a divergence with some economists believe is the main cause of the, of the euro crisis we've lived some years so far. So do you believe that the eurozone has the optimum size, both that it could be increased or decreased or as fine as it is? And the second one is which, which measures do you think that can be adopted for, for reduce this problem of the two velocities in, in Europe, which look like today is the most, most relevant threat to the euro? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I said also in my speech, uh, I didn't say ev everything, yeah, but uh, I said that uh, we have to work still on our economic and monetary union. We stabilized the situation. We uh, took a lot of initiatives uh, to, uh, to stabilize it also in the future by uh, setting up a surveillance mechanism on budgetary evolutions, um, on macroeconomic imbalances, it was completely new. Uh, we provided financial support when a country get in, uh, in trouble. We created the banking union, so we have one supervision for all the banks all in the Eurozone. So we did al already a lot to deepen the economic and monetary union, but it's not enough. It's not enough. And um, one of my frustrations of the last year, not a big frustration, I'm not really capable of being really frustrated, and that's, uh, but one of the frustrations is that we couldn't agree on much more economic coordination. And this issue has to be taken up by the, the new leadership of the European Commission and of the European Council. In the longer term, we need even more than that. We, even, and we have precise proposals on this economic coordination, but we need more than that. We need also, and I'm, we, I mentioned it together with my colleagues of the Central Bank, of the Eurogroup, and of the Commission two years ago, we need what we call some kind of fiscal capacity, as the United States has. 
And we even were very precise on the idea that having some kind of, n not to the full, but some kind of unemployment insurance in Europe, so a mechanism of solidarity. Some are even thinking further. Uh, and this is not, um, it's not an, uh, an, idea, an idea that is ripe now to implement, but once we have real convergence, then we can even issue what we call euro bonds. So, but it's come some kind of mutualization of that. But that is at the end of the process. What I meant to say is we need more to have a stable and lasting economic and monetary union. The problem is, and that we have to be very careful, and I said it also in the speech, but only in one sentence. In a crisis period, you can make and you can decide on qualitative jumps, qualitative changes. But once things are going better, that you see immediately the temptation of complacency. And that is, I spoke with many people also in the private sector, that is a temptation not only very specific for the public sector, this is also the case in the private sector. And you lose, I will not say quasi immediately, but you lose the sense of urgency. So if there is no market pressure, you need the pressure of the institutions. And that's why the European Commission, the Central Bank, and even the presidency of the European Council uh, have to play a crucial role to keep deepening of the economic and monetary union high on the agenda. Second part of your question was uh, the, the different speed in the, in the Eurozone. I think that you have more than two speeds. You have, you have, you have a, a lot of different situations, as you have in the United States, and you have in, in every monetary union. There is no monetary union, but every, every uh, economy, uh, regional economy, of local economy, is going in the same direction uh, and uh, is, is, uh, is uh, evolving at, at the same speed. At that. Uh, but what may not happen is that reforms that can take place don't take place. I'll give you an example. There, there is a lot of work that can be done at the national level. In France, if I would put it in this way, France had a lower unemployment rate than Germany in 2007. Can you imagine? Lower. It was about 9%. Now France has an unemployment rate of 11% and Germany of 5%. And this is not only due to the, let, let's say, the center-left government of today. It was already the case when Nicolas Sarkozy was president of France. So the, the, the difference was made by the quality of, the, of national politics. Germany started those reforms before 2005 and is reaping, let's say, the, the results of all this seven, six, seven years later. So this is doable. This is doable. Not everybody has to be as German, uh, doing as Germany uh, did, but also other countries made huge reforms. What, what the Italians are doing and the Spaniards are doing now is just unprecedented. So we have to keep those pressures that the, so that these, there, are, there will always be different speeds, but the difference between the speeds can be narrowed. And I'm convinced that this is possible that we can do this. The Greek case is a very special case. But I'm speaking now about, let's say, the, the other uh, members of, uh, of, the, of the Eurozone. So there is still a, a work uh, ahead, uh, but uh, it is a political project, was not sufficiently economically underpinned, but we are catching up, and I'm fu full of confidence that we'll do this in the future. Thank you very much for addressing us this afternoon. It's a pleasure to hear your talk about why Europe is good. Um, I have one question about um, the sort of efficient decision making in Europe. So over the last few years, we've seen that implicitly Angela Merkel is the leader of Europe as Germany has the strongest economy and they have had to contribute a lot to 
uh, bailing out a country such as Greece. Um, however, I d personally, I'm doubtful whether it's good to have one country leading Europe because um, that means that some measures are not implemented. For example, it took a long time before we have had qu quantitative easing. Also, some other reforms that the US and the UK have implemented very fastly after the financial crisis in 2007 are only being implemented in Europe now. So in the US, you see that the economy already grows again, also in the UK, but we are still in this slump near deflation. Um, so my question is, how can we as Europe make sure that we can more easily agree on terms to further integrate and should it be the case that Germany is always the leading country in determining what policies will be implemented and which policies won't? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm apologizing in advance when my answer is too long. You can, may interrupt me and say stop. Huh? First of all, the German economy was the leading economy already in the 60s. I'm apology that I'm all that old, but uh, yeah, I, I was following those policies already then. The German, the Dutch mark, the German mark was appreciating all the time, and the others were not following de facto devalu devaluing their, their their currency, sometimes keeping uh, the same level uh, as the Dutch mark, but most of the time, with the exception of the Dutch. Uh, there was a continued devaluation of, 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 of the other currencies. So, Germany is not recently the strongest economy, it's for quite a long time. Some of the countries were even in the beginning of the 90s, in the, uh, yeah, in the beginning of the 90s, so closely related to the Deutschmark that if the Bundesbank changed the interest rates, they were not following within the, the, the 10 minutes or the 15 minutes, but the 10 seconds or the 15 seconds yeah, of following the Deutsche Mark. We were not in the Eurozone, we were in the Demark zone. So just simply to say that the, the German lead is not something new, economically speaking. Second um, remark is that when I started as president of the European Council, um, the first meeting, there was no agreement between Germany and France at all. We have to compromise in the meeting. We succeeded. But afterwards, starting from March 2010 until the end of 2011, the period was named the Mercosy period. It was not the Merkel period. The Mercosy period. We forget all this. We forget all this. Uh, I was closely uh, in, not only involved with them, but I was in constant talks with them. But it was called the Mercosy period. So it was not only Germany. It changed after that France lost the AAA status. Then the, the, the role of Germany became more prominent. But during the, the, the biggest part of the Eurozone crisis, it was a Franco-German cooperation that was in the lead, that we, they were in the lead. But then in June 2012, we decided on the most important decision during the crisis, the so-called banking union. I can assure you, I will never read, wrote, read, read, uh, write my memoirs, but that Germany never thought before the meeting that they would decide this during the meeting. And second is that it was a common decision during, as I said, with the debate and with ups and downs, and finally we find a compromise. But for Germany, it was rather hard to accept, to give up the supervision, supervision of their banks. But they decided. And late, later on, Britain cooperated with us. What I meant to say is, then is most of the time much more complicated than Germany speaks and the rest is following. Berlin locuta causa finita. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Often the 
the power of some of the countries is a negative power. They don't accept this because everybody in the Union has, of in the Eurozone, has a veto power, has a veto power. And of course, when a big country, as Germany says, nine, then it counts more than, than others. That's true. But you have to also, the, 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 it is not always, let's say, a positive vote. It is from time to time also a negative vote, refusing something instead of pushing through some proposals. Again, and uh, it, it is more complicated than, than it's often uh, presented. My feeling is now that, um, and certainly when I look at the last decisions of the Eurozone, that there is much more consensus than most people think. I give you the example of the Greek crisis. The Greek minister Varoufakis, I never met him. Uh, he, he studied in the UK, by the way. But uh, Varoufakis, uh, he thought that he could divide the Union. You have the left-wing governments. He visited first Paris and Italy and Rome. Uh, and then you have the, the right wing. He, he never saw the German Chancellor before the meeting of the European Council in February. And this was a complete mistake, complete mistake. There was a Greek position and there was a position of the 18 other countries of the Eurozone. So it is much more consensual and it is an important issue than again most people think. What I'm trying to explain with examples is don't believe, not always, don't, don't believe the papers always, and don't believe caricatures. Of course, Germany is a very important country, the biggest country in the European Union, the strongest and best performing economy in the, in the Eurozone, but they are not alone. They are not alone. Uh, and the, the long crisis gives a lot of evidence to that thesis. Yes, Mr. Van Rompuy, thank you very much for addressing us um, this afternoon. Um, it's often said that um, UKIP, UKIP has sort of forced the con British Conservative Party into um, adapting a more Eurosceptic stance. And I was wondering whether you, within, within the meetings of the European Council that you attended as president of it, had seen a sort of change in the behaviour of David Cameron uh, when UKIP was not a very important force in uh, British politics to when it uh, became much more, much more powerful and high in the opinion polls. Mm -hmm. I will, not, I will answer your question, but not in, all the, not in every detail, because otherwise I, I would interfere in the uh, current election campaign and my good reputation in the British press is that <laughs> I won't, I won't uh, uh, harm this further. Eh? But uh, let's say that the UK position for decades is already a special position, for decades. They joined the Union later than uh, many other countries. They joined the Union, I think, 15 years uh, after France, Germany, Italy and the Benelux countries. So this was already a, a very clear signal. I'm not speaking about the period before 58 or, and, and so on. I've been speaking about since the creation of the European Community and the European Union. Second, they are not a part of the Eurozone and uh, they will never be a part of the Eurozone. Um, not only according to the declaration, but there is an opting out clause. Uh, all the rest, with the exception of Denmark also, is obliged to join the Eurozone when they met the criteria. They are obliged according to the treaties. Uh, so here, uh, the UK is already an exception. The UK is not a member of the, the Schengen Zone. The UK, UK got an opt-out on the so-called social chapter. So there, let's say there, there, is, there has always been a different attitude, a different position of the UK with all kinds of prime ministers vis-à-vis -vis the European Union. Yeah? Always be, have been, has been. So in, the, in this sense it is not, uh, not uh, really new. If, 
if there is an influence of the Eurosceptic vote, as you, uh, you explained. That's the second point. The third point is that, and I give you just my experience, that uh, we succeeded, and I said it also in my speech, to get an agreement on the European budget. And God knows how difficult it was, how, how tense the debate in the UK was. We, we got an agreement with 28 countries, including the UK, on a, this difficult issue of, uh, of the European budget. A budget which was decreasing in real terms. You can always agree when you, speak, when you have the role of Santa Claus. You distribute things and you appease everybody. No, that was not the case. We are decreasing at the demand, at the request of the UK, decreasing the level of expenditures in real terms. We could agree on this. We agreed with 28 on the banking union. Of course, the UK is not part of the single supervision mechanism, but they cooperated to make the legislation possible. The same on climate change. The same on sanctions on Ukraine and so on. There were exceptions. UK, the UK was not part of the, what we call uh, the Fiscal Compact Treaty. The, the, the Fiscal Compact Treaty, in just one word, uh, was uh, a, a treaty meant to, to create some kind of golden rule of budget balance for the Eurozone. We thought we could have an, a golden rule for all the 28. The UK was opposed, and so what we, what we did was to create or to conclude an intergovernmental treaty with 26 countries out of the 27, minus the UK. Okay, uh, but, and, but the UK didn't challenge this uh, uh, in court or some kind of, of legal, there was no kind of legal harassment. They accepted that we go further with the Eurozone in deepening the economic and monetary union. What I meant to say is, that overall the cooperation with the UK was much more positive de facto, de facto, not in theory, not in perception, uh, as was uh, often said. As Margaret Thatcher agreed, for instance, on the Maastricht Treaty, on the Maastricht Treaty, on the other treaties of Amsterdam, of Nice, there is, there is not a double speak, but there is a difference between the rhetoric and the work, let's say, in the European Council. And in the European Council, uh, I can't complain vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, the, the UK and the cooperation with its uh, Prime Minister. He made a lot of things that we needed in the Eurozone possible. Could be a little bit surprising, but that's my experience. I have a question uh, regarding trade. Uh, so you mentioned the successful trade deals, uh, trade investment deals that were signed uh, with South Korea and Canada, and also the deals that are still under negotiation uh, with the United States, uh, Mercosur, India, and others. Uh, do you think that the European Union has the political capital necessary to uh, make those deals go forward, either under this commission or the following commission? Mm -hmm. I can only say what I noticed uh, and what I recently heard, noticed during my term and what I recently heard. So there is, uh, from the side of the big countries, a clear commitment to conclude the so-called TTIP negotiations by the end of this year. Because next year will be an election year in the States, will be a difficult year. So this is a window of opportunity. Um, and the, the, I think the European Council will discuss this uh, issue, uh, I think, next week at the occasion of their, their meeting. But to, according to my information, there is a strong political will to go ahead and to make this deal possible. Because we are not only engaged in an economic growth policy on the short term. That's why we are changing monetary policy, even softening in some way, making more flexible uh, budgetary policy. That's why we are engaged in this investment policy uh, according to the, the, the Commission proposals. 
but we are also investing in a longer term policy. And trade policy is an important part of it. And uh, the EU-Canada uh, agreement, the EU-South Korea agreement, also with Singapore, uh, are important ones. With Japan, we are really making progress. Uh, it also depends on Japan, not only on the European Union, and the same is in the United States. But if you ask, and I'm not translating it in, word, in words of political capital, I, my word is, is there sufficient political will? Yes. Do we have to adapt uh, some uh, settlements or dispute settlements uh, in, uh, compared to what was agreed tens of times in other agreements, because it is not something new, eh? not at all. Eh? Yes, most likely, eh? that we have to be a little bit creative and, and to find uh, uh, new solutions uh, of, of new, new instruments for this kind of settlements. But the main question is, and that's my experience, where there is a political will, there is a way. There is a political will. There is a political will. And I, I hope that in a year's time we can conclude this. This is important not only for Europe, it's also important for the United States. And then we, together we can set standards for the world economy. That's really a transatlantic relation. I'm looking forward. Huh? Thank you again for your uh, talk. Uh, you, you've mentioned before democracy in Europe and over the last few years we've seen uh, the European Parliament making what some might call a power grab in Europe, uh, especially with the Spitzenkandidaten affair at the elections last year. Do you think this increases democracy in Europe or do you think legitimacy comes better from mm -hmm. heads of state and from parliaments, for example, exercising the yellow card? Mm -hmm. I was not... Uh a fan of this procedure. In Europe it is very well known, although I made very few declarations, but among the leaders it was very well known. And I was, I was not a fan, but other leaders, and not of the less, mo the, 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 of, the, of the less important countries, and this is an understatement, eh, were also not a fan of this, this procedure. But it, it became the, a fact of life. But to be very precise, the so-called Spitzenkandidat, for those who are not following this in detail, that means the candidates put forward by the political parties uh, to become, if possible, president of the European Commission. But those Spitzenkandidat were proposed by the political parties, not by the parliamentary groups, by the political parties. Not by the leaders, by the political parties. And that's one of the problems. An important party in this country doesn't belong to an important group in the European Parliament. And so had no say in the designation of a Spitzenkandidat. But that, that's a political choice. If you don't belong to a, an important political group, then you have to draw all the consequences. They, those groups decide then on Spitzenkandidaten. Uh, they, they decide on people you, you don't like or you don't support. But this is a, it, it's a party political issue. A party political issue. It's my second remark. And that, that's, uh, that explains a lot of the frustrations after the European elections. The third was that in the European Council, all the leaders, with one or two exceptions, as I said, belong to a political group. And there are two main political groups. The EPP, Christian Democrats and Conservatives, and the Social Democrats. They had an agreement among them, including the leaders, including the Prime Ministers, that the party who got the most of the votes, the strongest party, had the right to propose the, pres the, president, uh, the candidate for the president of the European Commission. So in the European Council, the EPP prime ministers had no problem to propose Jean-Claude Juncker because they, were, they helped him to, to appoint him the candidate of their own party. So it was not some, something that comes from outside. No, they 
the leaders, and it was in, in the meetings, the, media, the leaders decided that he was their candidate. And the socialist group who lost the election said, okay, we convened in advance on the rules, we agree with your candidate, and that's Jean-Claude Juncker. So it was much more a party political choice than a rivalry between the European Council and the European Parliament. The discussion, by the way, on the designation of Jean-Claude Juncker as the President of the European Commission took, I, I forgot, let's say 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and I'm not, I, I think it's even less. So it was, it was not a big debate because the, the overwhelming majority of the leaders were already engaged before the elections within their parties. They were engaged in the procedure and in the designation of the candidate of their party. Uh, and that explains a lot. If, if this is an, a good example of, uh, let's say, a strengthened democracy in the European Union, I have my doubts. I have my doubts. I think it is a very indirect uh, election. And those who are voting in my country, in my region, uh, for my party, it was very indirectly, but very indirectly, they are also voting for a candidate for the European Commission. They had not that really in mind. So, but that was my uh, analysis of the situation before the elections. But once we accepted the procedure, then we tried to implement the procedure for the best. And uh, the result was a rather easy designation in the European Council of the current president of the European Commission. You mentioned in your speech that um, nationalism creates war and that the European Union helped to overcome the state. But a lot of people nowadays still can't identify themselves with the European Union. They don't see themselves as Europeans, but rather as British, Dutch or French. So what do you think can be done to, uh, or can be done about that? Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, there is not until now a very developed European identity. Because you may not confuse identity with nationalism. I'm a Flemish. I'm very proud to be a Flemish. Very proud. I'm also a Belgian. I'm proud to be a Belgian. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not a Belgian nationalist. I'm not a Flemish nationalist. So there is a difference between identity and nationalism. And in identity even, you have an open identity. I'm Flemish, I'm Belgian, but I'm also Euro European. That's an open identity. You have also a closed identity, and then you come close to nationalism. Then, if your identity is, I'm Flemish, I'm Belgian, and so the, all the others are inferior because they have another religion, they, have another, they come from another continent, uh, they speak another language. They are, the, I, I put it in this way, I am somebody because I am different vis-à-vis -vis somebody else. Then you create a negative identity. You start in enemy thinking then you are not only very close, you are in the midst of nationalism. So I make this difference between identity and nationalism, and more specifically about make the difference between an open and a closed uh, identity. And, but being British and being proud to be British, not only there is nothing wrong with that, it is very natural, very natural. People tend to, to love their children. If they are stupid or they are ugly, they, they, are, they are their children. Their children. Uh, my kid is a beautiful kid, is a very smart kid, <laughs> which is true in my case. But that's very natural. 
and that's also uh, you have the same the, the same com you may, can make the same comparison with uh, with nations with cultures with languages and so on that, that's not really a problem so don't confuse uh, those uh, those concepts but from the, the, the start when you say the other is a enemy and I'm something I, uh, my identity is based on a negative identity on the difference I made a fundamental difference then you get really in trouble I fear that in some of our countries not in the Union but outside the Union uh, this kind of identity is created and unfortunately what Francois Mitterrand said and he he, he was uh, he lived in the First World War huh? Uh, that he, what he said is true, that nationalism means war. Nationalisme, c'est la guerre. Thank you. Do you see an end point to European integration? I give you a very, um, very strange and ambiguous answer. It doesn't interest me. In the Belgian context, uh, we are involved in the process of federalization of the country, devolution, uh, since 1970. And some are saying, look, you go step by step in the direction of the separation of the country, because you give more and more powers to the regions. You can also defend the opposite thesis. If we hadn't done this, then the country would have already collapsed. So federalism can be an integrating factor. That's why, by the way, the, the word is chosen, federare, to bring together in Latin. And I'm not interested in knowing what will be the terminus ad quem of the Belgian federalism. We will manage it and try to keep the club together and to, to have a, a, an, 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 an harmonious society as much as possible in the Belgian context with different adaptations of our institutions. And each generation has to take his, its responsibilities in this endeavor. The same is with the European Union. If we start speaking about the United States of Europe, of European federalism and so on, there's such defi such you create such divisions in the Union and such a divide in the Union and it's not really relevant. What we are doing now is much more relevant. But 19 states, we took an historical decision. You can say a wrong decision, but an historical decision. We said we have 19 sovereign states and we share a common currency the biggest transfer of sovereignty you can imagine. Monetary policy. The power of printing money. You know, in the Middle Ages, you had two central powers of the prince. The right to print money and the right to wage war. Most of the time, we wage war with printed money. <laughs> but you give up now this central power to give up the power to, to create money. So transfer of sovereignty. 100 years ago, I'm now exaggerating, but to make myself clear, you had one country with 19 currencies. Now we have 19 countries with one currency. So re this, re that's why I call it historical. Forget the numbers, it is the tendency that, that counts. But we created this, but we draw not all the consequences of this initial choice. The choice was deliberate. And now we have to deepen this also by necessity. I'm not playing on the philosophically on the words choice and necessity, but there is something, uh, there's a lot of truth in it. And so what we are doing now is to create an economic and monetary union in the Eurozone. Does this mean that we are, uh, we are creating a new state? No. Uh, is this the beginning of a new state? No. But it's a step further in our cooperation, our integration. To give you an idea, what for those who, have, who are dreaming of, of Europe as a state, eh, how far we are away from this. 
I just said we concluded, we agreed on the European budget. It's 1% of European GDP, 1%. Do you know what the average is of public expenditures in the, in the Eurozone and even in the Union? 15%, 5-0. That's the relative part of public expenditures in GDP. In Europe, the European budget, you know, the Moloch, the dictator, eh? uh, 1%, one, fi one fiftieth of this. So we're far away from creating a full-fledged state, not, not, not even the shadow of a full-fledged state. So I'm not interested in this long-term project. I'm interested, and that is the, let's say, the, the mission, the task of our generation. We made this historic choice of having one currency to integrate a reunited Germany in a more reunited Europe. It's a unique occasion, window of opportunity. We haven't drawn all the conclusions of this, so we are implementing this. And for the rest, we'll see further. We'll see further. Ladies and gentlemen, would you thank, help me in thanking Herr von Rompuy?